Hello, welcome to Surgical Products Magazine's live webcast. From vision to reality, planning, designing, and implementing the modern OR. I'm Rich Ritzma, Editor-in-Chief of Surgical Products Magazine, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon's broadcast. In the recent advances in surgical technology and techniques have greatly improved patient care by reducing procedure time and recovery time, as well as increasing patient and staff safety. In addition to these benefits, though, the same advances in surgery have also put a strain on many operating rooms, which may have been designed decades earlier. The accommodation of a myriad of new surgical systems and devices and more rapid turnaround times can pose a significant challenge to any healthcare facility. Today we're going to talk about what goes into developing a state-of-the-art modern operating room. To share their expertise and experiences with us, we've assembled a distinguished panel of experts who've been very involved in planning, designing, and building operating rooms that can efficiently and effectively meet the needs of today's complex surgery and also accommodate future technologies and procedures. Seated next to me today are Harvey Kirk, architect and health planner with Steffi and Bradley Architectures, Dr. Warren Sandberg, co-program leader of the CIMIT OR of the Future product at Massachusetts General Hospital, and Donna Doyle, administrative director of the Grant Revitalization product at Grant Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. What it tells you actually is that half of the people watching this webcast right now are in a project. Uh, and if they're representative of the hospitals in the United States, that means basically half of the healthcare industry right now is expanding operating rooms and procedure areas. This is a very important activity in the next five to ten years. Every hospital in the United States, these, these are certainly priorities, and, and that's actually some of the stuff that I'm going to be touching on today. Uh, before we begin the next presentation, we're going to take a look at our uh, third polling question. Um, for those involved in OR projects, which of the following equipment needs are you currently exploring? And you can check off as many of these as apply for this question. Uh, A, surgical tables. B, surgical lighting. C, equipment management systems and booms. D, audio and visual integration equipment. Or E, operating room fixtures such as cabinetry and stations. Uh, while we're tabulating these results, uh, we'll be hearing from our third speaker, Donna Doyle. As a nurse in the operating room for over 20 years, I've been involved in a lot of remodeling projects. But approximately three years ago, I was allowed the opportunity on a full-time basis to be involved in the design and the construction of a new surgical and heart hospital. Prior to that, as the operating room director in this facility, we had the chance to um, develop what we call a process excellence methodology or Six Sigma that was embraced by Ohio Health late in the 1990s. And as with most ORs, our ORs were built approximately in 1960s and last remodeled in the early 1980s. The processes that were in place for our patients going through the system was fraught with inefficiencies, and there were many frustrations among staff, physicians, and our patients most of all. And when I was invited to present today, one of the things I thought was, well, what does go into the development of a state-of-the-art OR? And as we talked about our processes and how broken they were, we thought we didn't want to move those to a brand new facility. So I thought it would be most appropriate to talk about how we do not build a brand new old OR suite. Some of the objectives today, I'd like to discuss the importance of grassroots involvement in the planning process, the importance of identifying our current and our future process flow states, and finally, the linkage between operational efficiency and quality. First thing we did was to identify the voice of the customer early on in the project. And we held focus groups with our patients and families. We held interviews with staff and physicians in trying to identify the wants and needs. And as we identified those wants and needs, we found that there was a real balance that had to take place between the reality of what our financial constraints were. 
In addition to that, we identified certain steps in the process, and those steps were either value added or non-value added. And between the two, the value added steps were ones that our customers told us they were willing to pay for. They were things that physically changed the end product, and they were things that they were done right the first and every time. The non-value added steps, conversely, were not essential. They did not add value to the process, and there were a lot of defects and reworks that resulted in delays. In addition, we found that the needs fell into actually four zones, and although the the zones are interrelated. Those four zones were also very distinct. One was quality of care, and many of those attributes fell into the realm of safety. Second was service. Those were the things that resulted in what we called positive patient and family experiences. Third was operational process efficiencies. And the last one was the environmental aesthetics, which had to do with work life and adjacency factors. The one I'd like to focus on today were the operational process efficiencies and especially how that directly links to quality and safety. Architects today are starting to tap a vast array of knowledge in the more than 600 peer-reviewed studies that are out there, many of which are cited by the Center for Health Design because they establish a connection between the physical environment and operational efficiencies. They further state that in improving a process, you will also improve quality. When you do improve your processes, however, you have to make sure that the changes you make are actually improvements. So you need some metric to measure from and then determine that that change is indeed an improvement. And ultimately, you want to design your spaces that incorporate your process flow changes because your customers in the end will judge your quality as the outcome of the processes. When we look at the process flow, we look at um, diagrams of not only our present, but how we want our future state processes. And this is where we need to tap into our grassroots involvement. And it's our staff and our physicians who really bring to the table all the intricate um, processes that they go through on a day in and day out basis and where the rubber meets the road that we don't always think about. So this is intricately important. We need to do this not only for our patient flow processes, but also for equipment and supplies. And inherent across all of these processes is the fact that there are informational flows as well that cross each of these lines. As we go through, we then have to go back to what the customer told us and take those non-value added process that bring nothing to the table and make sure that we have eliminated them from the equation. As we do that, what we get is a quality product. If we don't, then we end up with a cost, and many times that cost is poor quality, especially as it relates to safety factors. There's a 110-100 rule that states that if you don't fix a problem the first time, then later on it's only going to be more costly in terms of time and money. Joint Commission several years ago established also that linkage between quality and safety as they developed their national patient safety goals. And those national patient safety goals were in direct response to sentinel events that were occurring in this country. One of them states that patients are generally most at risk during a transition in care, and that's um, termed handoffs across the uh, setting, the service, or the level of care or providers. Joint Commission also says that sound system design is intrinsic to the delivery of safe, high quality care. Another part of Six Sigma that's utilized is trying to standardize not only your processes, but standardize your environment as well. And when we do that standardization, we tend to reduce variation and reducing variation then allows us to meet our customer needs it allows us to reduce rework, we reduce our costs, and ultimately we improve quality and we improve safety. Some of the other considerations with process flow 
is to look at the environmental flexibility, making sure the size of our rooms is appropriate, making sure that we have adaptable infrastructure, not knowing what future technologies are out there and can we accommodate them five years from now, making sure that we look at our demographics in relation to patient mix and patient specialty, making sure that we're building in reserve capacity and thinking of tomorrow, especially as it relates to data, which is increasing more and more. We need to make sure that the spaces we're designing for the functions today are flexible and adaptable enough so that if a different function comes down the road tomorrow, we are ready for it. And increasingly, the lines between surgery and interventional procedures are blurring, and we need to take that into consideration as well as the safety inherent in standardized rooms. In the project I've been involved in, some of the lessons that we've learned is, is once we've done those process flow analysis and, and designed future states, you can't just put it on a shelf after your design and let it sit there. It needs to be dynamic, and you need to revisit those flows often. Many times a project goes on for several years. People leave, new people come. You need to know why you made a change and what was the rationale for it. Communicate, communicate, communicate. It's very essential. And again, make sure that you have grassroots involvement in your flow and design. Your staff and your physicians are your greatest assets. Standardization promotes safety, and it's that culture of safety that promotes and drives your process flow analysis. Bottom line is everybody wants results. But you get what you expect, and you deserve what you tolerate. Bottom line is it's going to be a lot of work up front, but if you don't sweat it on the front end, you're going to bleed it on the back end. I ran across a quote from a gentleman by the name of Wayne Ruga in Modern Healthcare. And what Wayne says is in today's most effective healthcare settings, one can see the convergence of the influence of business, technology, and the humanities on the overall nature of the organization. And when we view healthcare buildings as artifacts of a given culture, it's easier to see how these forces are at work. Every organization has a culture that frames all its values and decisions. So in this regard, a healthcare facility is a tangible living testimony to the organization's beliefs and priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, we now have the results in of our third polling question concerning the equipment needs that uh, you are exploring for new OR, OR projects. Um, all big, big results for all answers. Uh, number one, though, coming in with about 87%, we've got equipment management systems and booms, which uh, actually we were talking about that uh, earlier over lunch was uh, the, the importance of the, uh, the boom systems and the uh, especially with the new technology coming into the operating rooms for organization? I think uh, your booms seem a bit like a bit of an extravagance, but uh, when you consider uh, that operating rooms are now 600 to 1,000 square feet in size, it's not possible to plug electrical equipment into the walls and then have it be close to the patient. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, however, all questions, including those that we were unable to get to today, will be posted on our website along with the panelists' responses. Um, I would like to extend a sincere thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Harvey Kirk, Dr. Warren Sandberg, and Donna Doyle. We very much appreciate your taking the time to uh, come and talk, speak with us this afternoon. Uh, I'd also like to expend, extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Steris Corporation, for making this webcast possible. And to you, the viewers, thank you. I hope you found our webcast informative and helpful. And I encourage you to fill out the short post-webcast survey that will appear on your screen shortly. Um, if you would like to review this webcast or share it with a colleague, it will be archived for six months on this website's microsite, which is uh, being shown on your screen now. From all of, all of us here in the studio, thank you again for joining us. Be well and have a pleasant rest of the day.